Hi, this is Michael Petrosian. I'm one of the pediatric surgeons at Children's National Hospital. I want to welcome you all to our new podcast series called Surgeucation. With the help of this series, we want to bring surgical education in a way that will make your child's care better. We want you to know that you are never alone. We're hoping that we'll, we'll be able to educate you, bring about knowledge, answer questions, and help take care of your child. I want to thank Mihan and Madero's family for strongly advocating for family education and sponsoring this series. Today, I want to welcome Dr. Timothy Kane to our first podcast. He is the Chief of Division at General Thoracic Surgery at Children's National Hospital. He is a world authority on the everything surgery, but specifically in foregut surgery. He has interest in foregut. I'm here, he's my mentor. He's tr- trained me. He's also a good friend and a partner. We, um, and we have interest, both of us, in foregut surgery. Today, we're going to discuss uh, achalasia. Welcome, Tim. Thank Thanks you, for joining us. What is the achalasia and how is it diagnosed? What is the incidence sure. of achalasia? So achalasia is a, a neurodegenerative disorder of the esophagus, specifically the, the body or the wall of the esophagus. And it affects the contractility and peristalsis or the movement of the esophagus and also uh, inhibits the lower esophageal sphincter from relaxing. So basically, as you eat food, the esophagus should move the food down into the stomach and as it, the entry of the stomach should relax and open up. Um, and in achalasia, it doesn't. So it's a tight sphincter, so food gets stuck in the esophagus. So the initial symptoms may be uh, difficulty swallowing. Uh, patients and kids specifically describe food getting stuck. Uh, they'll regurgitate food that they've eaten the day before. Uh, sometimes they'll lose weight because they can't really eat because they th- they're throwing up. And the other thing they can get is chest pain, which is... Uh, abnormal contraction of the esophagus trying to push food past that sphincter which is not opening up and a lot of times these kids go undiagnosed because of the symptoms are so broad right and uh, they get confused with reflux so how do you differentiate is it what test do you get or what test should parents ask for or, or inquire whether it's pediatrician or gastroenterologist sure so i and i can tell you also that the incidence is much lower in kids it's about one in a million um, although some studies are suggesting it's more common. And in adults, it's a hun- one in 100,000 people have the condition of achalasia. Not sure what causes it but and what the pre- presentation is. But in kids, um, 95% of kids under year, year of age will have reflux and they outgrow it. Um, but if you have reflux later on than that, um, you have to distinguish that from other esophageal conditions. And um, the gastroenterologist would initially order an esophagram, which is a uh, x-ray study where you swallow contrast and they measure the um, column of barium going into the esophagus and into the stomach and it should flow freely into the, into the stomach um, and they look for reflux on that study. Um, with echolasia, what you'll see is a, a narrowing at the sphincter where the contrast doesn't go through. It just sits there in the esophagus. So that's the initial s- study that's done. But that could also be uh, found in a reflux stricture. If you have bad reflux, you can get a narrowing of the esophagus there which is treated differently than achalasia. So the definitive study for achalasia would be, in addition to it doing an endoscope and looking at the lining of the, of the esophagus, for reflux strictures, what, what would be seen on endoscopy is, is a very inflamed esophagus, um, a narrow opening, and, and just diseased from And acid. most of the time, the gastroenterologist biopsy that to determine Correct. whether it's reflux-related stricture versus just achalasia, because you shouldn't have any changes in the esophageal lining of the organ lining uh, in the achalasia versus resof- reflux stricture. Correct. Uh, there's three types of achalasias, and that will determine based uh, will be determined based on the manometry. Yes. So, so high re- resolution manometry is the definitive test to diagnose uh, achalasia. In addition to what type? There's three types, and so uh, they all have a lower esophageal sphincter spasm or tightening. Doesn't relax. So Chicago type one. Uh, has sphincter tightening and inconsistent peristalsis of the esophageal body. Type 2 um, has a lower esophageal sphincter spasm and then no peristalsis. So the esophagus just sits there with little contractility. And then type 3 has the uh, LES spasm plus the um, discoordinated, really almost violent contractions of the esophagus, which contribute to a lot of the symptoms like chest pain and uh, difficulty swallowing and things like that. But all three respond to um, an interaction, a, uh, a surgical intervention on the, on the lower esophageal sphincter. And um, the two main surgical interventions and the ones that we, we offer are the POEM technique, the peroral endoscopic myotomy, and a laparoscopic heller myotomy.
Now, I know as a surgeon, we have bias towards the surgical treatment, but what other treatments that normally parents get offered before they come and see us? And uh, by the time parents come and see us, they're at the sort of the end of the medical treatment or failed medical treatment, and they require surgical intervention. And we'll talk about it later. But there's a couple other medical treatments that they've offered of that end up undergoing before they're coming to see us. Correct. And uh, what has your experience been with in kids with a Botox and balloon? So I, I would say the majority of kids um, that we see, a lot of them have had interventions unless we've been involved in their care. Um, our gastroenterologists are the mindset that most kids respond to surgical therapy and the and some of the medicines used and the dilatations are not effective. And and essentially, if you don't cut the muscle and you just use a balloon to dilate it, it's going to be temporary if you have symptom relief. Um, Botox injection works to relax the lower esophageal sphincter. That's also an endoscopic procedure done by GI doctors. And a lot of times GI doctors will say, let's do the least intervention here and see if it works. But um, almost 100% of the time, it's only a temporary fix. And for a child that has a long life ahead of them, uh, surgical myotomy actually gives long-lasting uh, results in better than 90% of kids. So by doing some other intervention first, whether it be a balloon or Botox injection, you can create scar tissue, which makes the subsequent surgery a little harder. Um, and we, we definitely have a fair share of kids who've had intervention before. And it's definitely diffi more difficult to do than someone who's not had interventions. Right. But On top of that, there's risk of perforation with balloon. Correct. So that's also something that we always uh, afraid of when we dilate ourselves that there is a ch possibility of perforating and we don't really, it doesn't really cut, it just tears everything apart mm -hmm. and symptomatically, yeah. symptoms go away for, for a little while and then they come back. Yeah, generally for uh, a balloon dilatation, it's a month or less. Yeah. But Botox, it's maybe a little longer, but almost always comes back. That's right. So there's two types of surgical treatments that we offer at Children's National and uh, Dr. Kane can elaborate a little bit more on a Heller myotomy. Um, this is done laparoscopically. It's an immunally invasive procedure. Um, and is currently, so I, I would say, standard of care. Mm -hmm. Standard of care, um, although now with increasing experience with the poem uh, since 2010, uh, you know, most, most surgeons will do either a laparoscopic or a robotic Heller myotomy. Um, for kids, robotic surgery is not really eff um, effective because the instruments are really large. So we can do laparoscopic surgery in, in the smallest kids we, we do for, for Heller myotomy have been between three and eight months of age. So those are kids we would do a lap heller for. For kids larger than three years old or two years old, they're big enough that can they can undergo a poem. And so we've done kids in that age size, uh, and weight size and, and age range. Um, but the, the heller myotomy basically comes from the outside and cuts the muscle. And then oftentimes you have to dissect around the esophagus so you can create a hiatal hernia or a, a reflux uh, from that operation. So you have to do some usually it's some type of anti-reflux procedure. And for uh, uh, achalasia, the anti-reflux procedures are partial wraps, which are by definition are less effective than a full wrap. But to do a full wrap around the esophagus, you're actually contributing to potentially difficulty Difficult. swallowing. So, so for, parents, for those parents, wrap means you take part of the esophagus, the upper part of, excuse me, stomach, and wrap around the esophagus, creating a sort of pseudo sphincter mechanism so it prevents reflux acid and bile reflux into the esophagus but as dr kane said you break down the narrowing you don't want to create another narrowing by wrapping the stomach so the wrap is done in partial fashion and it's really not that effective and uh, it's also controversial some surgeons don't even do wrap right i can tell you believe, that, believe in it yeah i can tell you that a lot of surgeons who deal with kids who are growing who do a lot of lap heller myotomies will actually not do a wrap because as a kid grow, a child grows, they can twist the wrap, they can, it can cause a point of fixation, and then oftentimes uh, you have to go back in and take the wrap away, sometimes redo the myotomy. So in our practice, we've gotten away from it because it's much easier to treat reflux than it is uh, to treat the difficulty swallowing, which can be a big problem with, with anybody who's had a myotomy initially. For kids. And um, in terms of offering POEM, it's based based on a discussion between us and the family. So sometimes we've had patients come in and say, well, they would prefer the Heller myotomy, but the majority actually are, are leaning towards POEM because th as you do the POEM, um, you can actually tailor the myotomy um, based on the intraoperative uh, balloon uh, catheter we use to measure the esophageal diameter 
and distensibility. It's called an endo flip. And then also, if you do a, a, a poem, you can, it doesn't preclude going back and doing something else later, whether it be a repeat poem or a balloon dilatation or even a Heller myotomy. But we, ha we have a series of kids who have had Hellers either here or elsewhere that have had dysphagia that we've gone back and done poems on, and they've done quite well. So it's, it's a different uh, aspect of the esophagus. So you, you basically have you know, 360 degrees of the esophagus to work with. So um, it's been And for those, who, for those parents, if your child had an operation or a medical procedure, whether it's been balloon dilatation, um, Botox injection, uh, or Heller myotomy, the POEM procedure, which is, in our opinion, is one of the best procedures in achalasia, is still feasible because it's it's done through the esophagus, not through the abdomen, and it's basically, like Dr. Kane said, it's a 360 degrees of tissue to work with. So if the cut was performed on one side, obviously the myotomy that's going to be done through POEM will be on the opposite side that will be determined during the operation. So it is still feasible to do the operation, even though you had the previous uh, achalasia operation that failed if your child still has symptoms yeah. of the achalasia. In, in our experience, we've not had to um, revise any of our poem uh, procedures to repeat myotomies. Uh, we've done a couple poems in kids who had poems elsewhere, um, and some Heller my um, had in poems in kids who had Heller myotomies elsewhere. Um, but the, the most that we've had to do in some kids after poem is, is a single balloon dilatation. Um, and that, that sometimes breaks the muscle fibers because after they heal, they can, they can create some scar tissue and then also with growth. Correct. Uh, I think the important point for parents to take is that while it's great uh, that we have with these procedures, it's important to understand the achalasia itself doesn't really go away. Correct? Correct. It, it doesn't go away. We just treat the symptoms. Right. So your child gets better, they go have normal life, which is very good, it's phenomenal. But the but to say we treat we your achalasia goes completely away, it, it's really not true. Right, the esophagus will always have abnormal contractility. Um, there's little information or data to suggest that the esophagus heals or cures, but what we're treating is a symptomatology. Um, we, we're preventing weight loss, we're allowing a normal life because kids can gain weight and they can eat normally. But the esophagus will always have abnormal contractility. What we don't see in kids, which sometimes hap which happens often in adults, is they get a, such a dilated esophagus that the adults go on to end-stage achalasia where their esophagus needs replacement. We don't have any, there's no data, there's no you know, literature about that happening to kids. So we think it might be different. And in kids, you actually respond better to surgery because if you, if you do it early, you, you have a chance to kind of allow the esophagus to grow and heal and hopefully not need interventions in the future like some adults need. Correct. You get how the procedure done and, and what it entails. Sure. And the topic um, procedure involves putting an um, endoscope in the esophagus under general anesthesia. Which is a camera. Mm -hmm. It's just like the endoscope they likely had when they had their um, endoscopy by their GI doctors. And then we um, take measurements of the esophagus to calculate where the sphincter is um, and where, where we're going to make the incision in the esophageal wall about you know, 10 to 20 centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter. And then we insinuate the camera between the mucosa of the esophagus, the lining, inner lining of the esophagus, and the muscle. And then we dissect all the way down to the stomach. And then once we have that created that artificial tunnel, then we can see beautifully where the muscle is, and then we just cut the muscle from the stomach side up to the esophagus side, and usually that's anywhere from uh, five to seven centimeters. And then at the time of surgery, we use a uh, balloon catheter called an endoflip balloon, which measures the esophageal, um, lower esophageal sphincter diameter, as well as the distensibility. And then we can uh, pretty carefully calculate how much we need to cut that muscle and how long to make... Uh, uh, relieve the difficulty swallowing. And initially, what we see classically on, on the balloon catheter is that the diameter of the esophagus is about, it's in millimeters, like five to six, seven millimeters. It's tiny. And I show the parents the pictures before and after. It's like an hourglass. And then after, it looks more like a, a straight tube or just a mild waste um, in the, uh, across the sphincter. And it's over 10 centimeters, typically, which will um, tell us that we've cut the muscle enough. 
And then after cutting the muscle, and we were happy with the balloon catheter measurements, we clipped the lining of the um, esophagus closed. And then the uh, child wakes up, and the next uh, does not is not given any anything to eat or drink until the next day. We do an esophagram, basically just to calibrate uh, the esophagus in, in case down the road there's symptoms. We can always repeat the esophagram. And then um, typically that we, we get that baseline study. We haven't had any leaks or any, any problems uh, with that study, so it's basically a baseline. And then we advance the diet on clear liquids and then basically a no-chunk diet for two weeks. But most kids will go home the uh, day after surgery or two days after, depending on how far they live away from the hospital or the area and if they're tolerating diets and not needing IV fluids and things. In, t in terms of pain, most kids don't complain of any pain. Some will have a sore throat from the breathing tube and the endoscope, um, but that's a pretty much the, um, the most common complaint, but right. uh, not significant. Uh, we do have a lot of par patients who came through here, and you want to tell a little bit to our listeners? Uh, sure. One of our, um, one of our parents created a, uh, basically because no one knew about achalasia in, in her area, in her state. Uh, she created a Facebook page called Parents of Achalasia Kids, and she's been a, a champion for uh, getting the word out about um, achalasia. And there's there's um, patients and families on this Facebook page, which include adults, some adult patients, basically as a, a, a chat and support group, because in, in a lot of areas, no one's ever heard of this. And particularly in her uh, instance, when her son got an upper, upper GI, the radiologist said he'd never seen this before. And we see it all the time here, but you know we're in a big center in a big city. Uh, but a lot of places out away don't don't see it. And if you, you don't know what you don't know, if you haven't seen it, then you may not know it. So she's been really a champion of, of creating this um, a Facebook page. And, and there are testimonials there. You can, if you're interested, you can go to Parents of Akalesi on Facebook, find the group and sort of register and inquire. Uh, if you have any other questions regarding the procedure or just in general you want to uh, talk to us about the procedure or anything else, feel free to contact us through childrensnational.org is the website. You can also directly email us at info at surgeucation.com and the link will be right below the video as well as the podcast. Um, I want to thank you for being here, Tim. Hopefully, this, like I said earlier, this won't be our last uh, conversation and we're hoping that with this podcast we'll be able to teach many of you out there about the disease. We do have those procedures here. We have great experience. Come and visit us, and we'll be happy to answer any other questions if you have in the future. Thank you, and have a great day.